coming week. All right. So debugging is going to give us the ability to introspect our programs while they're running. Before we get into how we debug using GDB, I want to give you a chance to think through a challenge problem, right? And oops, uh, I meant to unhide the slide. So there's a slide here that is not in the slide deck posted on uh, Sakai. So this is the first time everybody is seeing this. I'm going to make this much larger. Uh, what I'd like you to do, I'm going to open up some questions in just a moment on Poll Everywhere, and we'll come back to Q&A after this. Uh, but I'd like you to try reasoning through the program you see on the left-hand side of this slide and uh, responding to this. And we'll spend about uh, three or four minutes trying to think through what you expect is printed here. And then we'll come back and discuss what's actually happening and, and play around with this ourselves. 80% uh, of the class, 86% of you said that only in 2020 would not be printed, right? So um, let's just put down, let's just uh, make some remarks here. So 86% uh, uh, of you said this is false, right? Meaning that this print statement wouldn't be printed. And then another, uh, let's see, let me change back to my mouse here. Another 70% said that this one wouldn't be printed. So there's, there's obviously some mistrust here and, and, and the, the lack of trust uh, is when you're working in C is not unwarranted, right? So just about everybody says in no world should either of these two print statements be evaluated. Before you try and run this, I wanna just give you a demonstration of uh, what's going on here. So I'm gonna open up, uh, and let me make this a little bit bigger. Uh, I'm gonna open up the debug.c program, which has this exact same code in it, right? So this is just what we were looking at. Um, we've got our max function, and this is exactly verbatim what, what the slide was started with. So I'm gonna go ahead and compile this, so GCC. I'm gonna use the G flag, which gives us debugging symbols, which we'll use later. And I'm gonna use the standard C11. I'm not gonna print anything with warnings yet. We'll come back to that. Uh, and debug.c, all right? So program compiled, no problem. Uh, I look and I've got an A dot out here. So let's see what happens. So I'm gonna run this, all right? And uh, I want you to look at this output. What even is life is printed? And you're probably thinking, what is going on? The world is on fire. This can't be happening. What is happening here? Because this is a statement that means there's something wrong with our max function, right? And if we go back and we look at it, it sure looks like, well, if the first one doesn't print, if only in 2020 didn't print, then what is it that would cause what even is life to print? That seems very strange. Now I wanna make one more small modification to this program before we continue on uh, and, and show you one other variation of this, right? So vim debug.c and uh, I'm going to add another print statement here. So printf uh, what is happening, right? So I'm gonna add another print statement. We know that this print statement is definitely gonna run and we would expect that, okay, what is happening prints and then for whatever reason, what even is life is printing. Let's see what happens when we compile this uh, and then go run it. So I'm gonna do my comp compilation and dot dot slash a dot out, right? And what is happening only in 2020? What even is life? And hopefully at this point, you're sitting there thinking like, what? in the world is going on because this is not how our programs should work, right? This is nothing about this feels good as a software engineer. We added a print statement and now we're seeing different behavior in that first printf, right? So we're gonna get to the bottom of what actually is happening here, but in order to better understand where our problems are originating from, we're gonna learn a little bit about debugging in the process. So what I'd like you to try doing is pulling today's lecture materials. Uh, and if for some reason you have trouble moving along with today's lecture materials, uh, just getting a, going back to the previous announcement that was shown in the first slide on the slide deck and getting this repository cloned will be fine. 
Um, but once you start up your uh, container, you should be able to change your directory inside to be inside of that container. Uh, to in the lecture directory, which is our repository for our exercises that we'll be doing in class. Uh, Git pull origin master will pull down the latest and this will give you an LS18 directory, which I've already changed into. So if I were to go back to here and look at my, my working directory, uh, ignore, uh, right, I, I cloned this in the wrong directory, so I'm, I'm actually deeper into my, you, you should ignore all this. The point is uh, from lecture LS18 GDB, that's where you wanna be. Uh, I, I actually cloned this earlier today and in, in my labs directory of, of another place, I'll have to fix that afterwards. But you should see a directory LS18-GDB show up. Uh, and I'm gonna give you all a minute to work through um, these instructions here. And we're not yet gonna use GDB, but I want you to try pulling this, seeing if you can compile uh, debug.c. And I just am gonna open up a separate poll in just a moment while you're working on this to be sure that uh, most of us at least are, are uh, caught up here. And if, we, uh, if, if some of you aren't, that's totally fine. All right, I'm seeing about 90% of responses are were able to compile. Um, so I'm gonna talk just a little bit more about what's happening here, uh, and then we'll move into using GDB next. So the GCC compiler uh, has many different options. One that we've been using that you've seen before is this dash G option, and today we're gonna see why it's important. Normally when you compile a program, if you don't specify like this dash G option, which means I compile this program with debugging symbols, where symbols are things like the names of our functions, the names of our variables, most of those naming um, um, concerns of, of all of the things that we chose in our program uh, when we wrote the program, by default, if you're compiling a program to run directly on your machine without any debugging symbols, uh, all of that would be lost. Your variable names only mattered to produce the program, they don't matter really to the program itself once it's compiled for the machine. The machine doesn't care what you name your variables or your functions or things like that, you'll come to learn. And it, it, it doesn't know anything about those things. Um, but when we're working with our programs after the fact and we wanna be able to debug them and actually introspect what's going on or see what's, what is the value of the variable at this point in my program, we need those symbols. And so there's a special way of compiling you know, uh, what we call our executables, our binary files that have the machine instructions, and then also include our debugging symbols, which say, hey, if you're working with this part in memory, that, that corresponds, you know, to this variable A uh, in this function definition, when machine code, that actually corresponds to this function definition in C. And so it retains some information about your original source code in the binary, even though it's still just machine instructions under the hood. So this is what's going to allow us to run our program and pause our program in mid-flight and step through it line by line by line, even though uh, the machine itself is, is completely unaware of, of what exactly those lines are. This is some extra information we're, t we're building into our executable so that we can do this. Um, when you ultimately are writing a product, and, like an app on the App Store uh, or something like that, when you go to actually deliver a product to customers, typically you won't include these debugging symbols because they do cause the size of your programs to be a little bit larger and can slow down your program. But when we're developing and when we're learning about how to write systems code, uh, we're gonna be using debugging symbols throughout the semester. All right, so GDB is the GNU debugger uh, and the DB goes back again to its Unix roots. There's a debugger that they had built in, in, in Unix and GDB is an implementation of that. Uh, that's gone much further and farther than, than the original did. What I just talked through was this notion of debugging symbols. Uh, I don't need to repeat all of that, but basically we've got more information about what's actually happening in our program by including those debugging symbols. Once we've started a debugger, and that debugger is hooked up to a running program, that's the process we're trying to debug, we can do things like step line by line, one line at a time. We can set breakpoints. So we say, hey, uh, at line 53, that's when I want this program to pause, but until you reach line 53, just run this program as fast as you can. Uh, we can see what are the current values of variables as our program is running, um, what stack frames are we in, and we'll look at that in just a moment. Uh, and there's some really cool things we can do with watches and conditional breakpoints, which we'll get into in just a bit. 
So the key things to understand with GDB, uh, and actually I'm gonna ask one more question in just a second that I'm super curious of, um, which, because you all are primarily coming from the pilot of 211, or sorry, the pilot of 210. Uh, and I'm very curious in 210 or otherwise, have you used a debugger? All right, yes, no, and maybe, All right? So I'm really curious, uh, and I'm putting this question up right now, so it just opened. Have you used a debugger in any other class? Did 210 uh, teach you debugging uh, or anything like that, All right? It's looking like about half of you have seen a debugger, half haven't. So by that measurement, I'm guessing that not much time was spent uh, in, in 210, and that's totally fine. Uh, if you have seen a debugger before, some of this is gonna be review, uh, but enough of you over half have not seen one before. Uh, so let's just get into this uh, in a fully detailed way. All right, so the idea is we're gonna run our program, and before it even reaches the first line of code, by default, we're gonna be paused right there. And it's gonna be on us to decide, hey, do you wanna run this line of code and move to the next line of code? So we, we're like, uh, if you've seen the movie, The Matrix, it's like we're in The Matrix and we're, we've paused time and we get to control how uh, we process and move through our program. And the default classical way of moving through a, a program once it's paused is to step into a line. All right, so um, we're gonna see that GDB is textually driven and we'll try running GDB in just a moment and try some of these things out. And what you can do is with the step command is you're saying, hey, evaluate the next line. And if that line contains a function call, I want you to step into that function call. So we're gonna jump into whatever function gets called, even if, and if there's more than one, we would jump into whichever is the first function call to evaluate. So jump into some function call and continue on there and you're still moving line by line by line. You'd have to press run step, step, step to move line, line, line forward and evaluate each line uh, sequentially. You can write just the S command for short, which is short for step to move line by line in this way, All right? So we can try this out really quickly. Um, if we run dot slash, uh, GDB and then our program name dot slash a dot out, so this was the command. Uh, the program is GDB, and we give at, as the first argument to GDB, what is the program we're trying to debug? And because this program was compiled with debug symbols, um, oops, uh, we should be fine. Let's see, oh, I accidentally, so I was in the wrong directory. I need to quit out of GDB. So when you need to get back out of GDB, you can quit it. So I was in the directory above uh, the lesson. So I'm gonna go into the LS18, Oops, CD LS18 uh, GDB directory. And now I'm gonna try running that, that command again. So I'm gonna uh, go back up, GDB dot slash a dot out. All right, and this time around, you'll notice that it says it's reading symbols from dot slash a dot out. And that means everything's good to go. Um, there's one common error you'll see with GDB on our container, and as soon as we see that, I'll mention it. Um, but if you see some errors uh, as you're starting up a program or you start running it, you can typically ignore those as long as it looks like it's working otherwise. Uh, again, the command is GDB, that's the program, and because we've compiled with this with symbols, it's able to read those symbols. If, uh, and I'll just show you this just for completeness, uh, if I had done GCC uh, debug.c without those symbols, and I had started up GDB in the same way, Notice that if I didn't use that dash G flag, it's telling me no debugging symbols were found. And so we would get a lot of gibberish. We wouldn't know what variables we were looking at or what the names of our functions were, things like that, right? So uh, by compiling with G and just for a good measure, the C11 standard, our debug.c program and running GDB with that executable, we're able to read those debugging symbols and that's what you want. Otherwise, it's gonna be very confusing to look at the output. So when we first start GDB, our program is paused. We can use a list command to see what are, where are we kind of currently at, but we wanna start, all right? So we start and it says we're putting in a temporary breakpoint. And this is the warning or error that you'll, you'll see every time you use GDB and that you can 
safely ignore. Uh, we'll talk about exactly what this means in just a, uh, not today, but very soon. There's a meaning to this that, that will be important to our understanding of the underlying system. Um, but for today, we're, for today, we're not really worried about it. So we can ignore that. So what it's saying is we're starting this program and we've established a temporary breakpoint at, and this is the file, debug.c. Remember, this is our compiled program, so the symbols are keeping track of what file are our functions actually defined in. And soon we'll see there, we can compile C programs from multiple files. And uh, I had added that printf statement. So I'm actually gonna go back out and make mine mirror yours. So I'm gonna get rid of that print statement so that we're on the same page here, right? So I had made a quick change to this file. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and, and change it back and begin debugging again. All right, so when we begin debugging, you'll notice that the very first line that the debugger is on is that first line that actually has a meaning that when we after we evaluate this line, i's value should be zero, right? And if we wanted to see the context of where we're at, so notice uh, when we hit this temporary breakpoint, when we started our program, we're paused right here at line nine, which is the first line of code that has a meaningful statement to evaluate, right? This was just a declaration statement, so we didn't actually need to do anything. But on this one, we're initializing the variable i, uh, and so when I run the command step, that brings us to the next line. And if I were to uh, look for info locals, we would see that even though uh, h is has not yet been initialized, right? Uh, its value currently is zero, by some stroke of luck because we haven't initialized it. So we haven't yet uh, actually processed the line where h is assigned a value of 100. Um, and notice, and I'll come back and talk about this command in just a moment, we can look for information about our local variables. What are the values uh, in, assigned to each of our local variables when we're at some point in our program? So I press step, or I run the step command again. And the next step that we're about to evaluate is this if statement. So it hasn't yet evaluated it. So what we just did was we just evaluated h is assigned 100. And if I were to check my locals one more time, so info locals, we can see that the current value of i is zero, the current value of h is 100. So hopefully you're getting the sense that as we use this step command, we're moving uh, line by line. What happens is we evaluate the current line and then we print what the next line would be that we're evaluating. So the output we see after running step is what's about to happen, not what just happened. And that's something that uh, can be a little bit confusing at first, right? So what's about to happen if we were to step again is we would step into the max function, right? So we have this function call and I press step again and notice that we get some output that's trying to tell us a little bit about this function call. So it's telling us we're calling the function max. The A parameter is being assigned the zero argument. The B parameter is being assigned the 100 argument. And the line of code that we're jumping to, what, that where this function is defined is debug.c line 26. And the next line we're about to evaluate is this if statement. If we were to press step again, that if statement would be evaluated, right? So, once again, if we list where we're at, so with the list command, we're gonna get some lines of code in our original program around where we're, we're paused at. So right now we're on line 26 and we just jumped into this max function, right? So this is very quick. I'm gonna give you some time to try playing around with this uh, in an interactive mode in just a moment. Uh, at any point, if you wanna quit out of a session where you're working on GDB, you can give the quit command and it's telling you that, um, hey, there's this, this, this program that's running, a.out, the, the process that's running that is currently just paused, uh, that we're debugging, we're, we're actually attached to that process that's running, and it's just, as I mentioned, paused. Um, in order to quit GDB, it, that process needs to be killed or, or, or terminated. And so it's asking us if that's okay, and I'm gonna say yes, right? So that's the step. Uh, 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 command and it's moving forward by one line and if we reach a function call we're jumping into that function call and stepping into each function call that we get. If we were to have kept if we kept stepping we would have stepped back out of a function call as well when we hit the return statement. The next motion actually jumps over function calls so if we reached a line of code that had a function call in it it would evaluate that line but it wouldn't actually step into it. And this is useful when we reach things like printf 
function calls where we don't really want to step into the printf function definition. That's probably a scary thing to look at. Uh, and, and that's actually a macro and would be all sorts of other uh, uh, weird things. You're free to explore it. Um, but typically when you see function calls that are outside of what you care about or your program, uh, you use the next step that will actually evaluate a, a full on function call for, uh, across any function calls on a line of code and then move you forward one more statement. All right, so this doesn't bring you into a function and then have to uh, cause you to come back out. If you do find yourself inside of a function that you just want to finish processing this function and return from, you can use the finish command. And that finish command says, okay, within my current function, go until I reach a return statement. And whatever that return statement is, process it, and then bring me back to where I was leading up to this function call. And these three wind up being the bread and butter of how you're going to be moving through a program as you're trying to debug it. Uh, and we'll look at some other ways of, of sort of fast forwarding or letting the program run until it reaches a certain point in just a moment, All right? So what I'd like you to try doing is we've already done steps one and two, um, but what I'd like you to try figuring out is can you determine the second return value from the max function given what we just looked at with uh, the step in the finish command? So you're going to start up a GDB session and then use the start command to begin at the very first line that needs to be evaluated. And then what you'll continue doing is run step, run step, run step. Uh, when you get into max the first time, you can use the finish command to say, okay, go until it returns. And, and that'll give you some sense of what its return value is. And then keep stepping until you get back into max and try finishing it out again and respond on pull everywhere with what is the second return value to the function call to max. Right. And I'm going to open up that poll in just a moment. All right. Great work here. 70% correct. And the only way that you would know that you were correct is by stepping through with GDB. So I'm excited to see that uh, you all were able to successfully do that. So just to replicate what's going on here, and in case uh, yours wasn't working, just to get a feel for what would happen uh, once we get yours in business, if I start up a GDB session with the a.out program that we've compiled, and I start debugging, right? So we ignore that warning, that's okay. So this S command is short for step, right? So S and step are synonymous, so I do S, S, and then we reach this function call if main, or sorry, if max of i and h, i is zero, h is 100, so step into that. And so we've stepped into max. And what I'm trying to just figure out is what is the, ret the second return value? I'm, I'm actually, I'm, I'm gonna say finish uh, for this function call to max. I don't really care about stepping through all of its logic. And notice that it's telling us uh, that the returned value is 100. So, okay, the first time we called max, the return value was 100. That's great. Uh, so I step again and I is assigned 10. I step again, I step again. And now we reach uh, this call to max again, the second if statement where we're calling max one more time with I that's 10 and H that's zero. And so we call max, A is assigned 10, B is assigned zero. So we get to actually see the transfer from arguments to parameters. And we see that we're in max. Well, we're curious, what is the return value of this second call? So I'm once again, I'm just gonna write fin short for finish. And wow, the return value of the second call to, uh, to max was 100. That wasn't even one of the two values we gave it. So this is breaking our model of what's going on. All right, so we kind of get the sense that for some reason, the wrong value is being returned by max. And some of you have already figured out what this is. Uh, I don't want to solve this quite yet because there's some other tools uh, that we can identify uh, and make use of in GDB to help us narrow in on the problem here. But we've kind of started to get a sense that, hey, this is an unexpected result, All right? So we probably need to go look at our program and see what's up, All right? So I go to debug.c. Uh, and if we look down at this function, we've got, uh, you'll notice that there's two, uh, a chevron here. Uh, the chevron are these two greater than symbols. It's telling us there's probably something wrong with this line of code. Uh, I'm not gonna preview that yet, 
But this seems like pretty innocuous code. We can imagine cleaner logic than this. Uh, we could just compare A and B directly, but I wanted to show you something that's surprising in C. Uh, and so we don't re yet know what to do, but one of the things I wanna point out is we know that max starts on line 25, right? And uh, if this is going wrong, this must mean that there's something, it has something to do with this result variable, right? So one of the things we'd like to be able to do is start up our program and have it just run all the way until it hits line 25, right? We'd like to set a breakpoint, and a breakpoint just means pause on some specific line on line 25. So I'm actually just gonna scribble a little note down um, over here, break on line 25. All right, so we'll come back to that. One of the things that we can do, uh, some of the other information that we can get out of our program is we can see where we're at in the call stack. And those of you who went through Comp 110, you remember drawing out our memory diagrams and spending a lot of painstaking time thinking step-by-step step through how function calls work. Well, I promise you all that time we invested in Comp 110 or in other courses you may have taken, if you didn't take 110, that gave you an introduction to how function calls work and frames on a stack, uh, the where command is going to give us the ability to show us where in the, uh, our program we are and what are all of the frames that are currently being processed right now or that we're, we have function calls that we need to return back to. Uh, we've seen the list command. And so this is these are some uh, commands that we can use in GDB to just get a sense of where we're at in our running program. We've also seen this info locals, which tells us what are our local variables that are defined inside of a function. And info args will show us what are the arguments that a function was called with. And when, when we step into a function, we know that we can see those arguments directly printed out before us. Um, but sometimes you set a breakpoint inside of a function and you're not gonna see those arguments directly and you can inspect them this way. We'll try that in just a second. Uh, lastly, we can print a variable's expression and, and this will be something we can practice here in just a moment. Right? So when you're trying to figure out where you add in a program and make sense of if, you, if you're if you have a breakpoint at some specific place, which is what we'll look at next, get a sense of where you're at uh, and what are some of the values of the variables, the arguments, uh, and things you might want to know. I should also notice that, or I should also mention that by default, lists, uh, when you use the list command, it, it, it gives you the, the context that are like the 10 lines around where the execution of your program currently is paused at. Um, but if you wanted to be more specific, you can give the, the range of lines that you wanted you want printed out. All right. So we want to be thoughtful about where we pause our debugger. And we've made this note, we'd love to pause or break at line 25. And the reason about for this is as our programs become a little bit more complex, it's often that you want a significant amount of code to have been evaluated before you actually need to pause, right? And having to step uh, step, 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 step through until you reach some bug that's you know thousands of instructions or millions of instructions into your program uh, is very unwieldy. So the good news is we can give some indication where we want the debugger to pause with break statements and some other tools. Right? So let's first look at um, breakpoints. Right. So we can set a breakpoint, and again, this is like saying, "Hey, pause the program when once you reach this line." And if we're doing this in a single line or a single file program like we're working on right now, we can just give a command break and then the line number, right? If we're working later in the semester on multiple files, you say the file name. So in this case, it would be debug.c colon and then the line number. And that's how you'd set a breakpoint within a specific file. So let's try this out. Um, I'm going to, so again, we're, we're trying to pause the line. And actually, since the line 25 is just, just a declaration, I'm gonna uh, modify my suggestion here and say, let's, let's break at line 26. Let's break right here at this if statement, right? Before we go into that, let's see what happens, right? So uh, I'm gonna quit out of Vim and go back to uh, my terminal. We didn't change anything about this program. We were just looking at it, so we don't need to recompile it. And I'm gonna go ahead and clear my screen to get it all at the top in GDB 8.0. Okay, so before we begin our program, um, I'm gonna set this breakpoint. So I'm gonna say break 26. And it gives us some feedback. It says that, hey, there's a breakpoint that's been set at this specific line in debug.c. 
And now what we can do is rather than start our program, when you start your program, it's, it sets an, an implicit breakpoint automatically for you on the first line that would run and pauses the program there. The other way of beginning your program is to run your program. So I'm gonna give the run command here and we run. And again, we see that same warning. We're ignoring that warning. It's not our concern. It tells us we're starting the program, whatever this warning is, whatever. And then we've got this breakpoint and we hit this breakpoint in debug.c. Notice we're in the max function. And this is actually being helpful here. It's telling us, hey, here are your argument values. But just as we saw in the previous slide, we could do info args and have that information printed out to us to see what arguments were given to this function and info locals. And we can see that the only local variable here that's separate from our arguments is this result variable whose value is initially zero. Uh, and that's cool. Uh, so this makes sense, we kind of just, we, we were curious about the second time this function ran, right? The first time this function ran, things were fine, but something was funky about the second time. So what I'm gonna do now is rather than step, 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 we can have our program continue until the next point, uh, the, until the next breakpoint is reached. So I'm gonna give the continue command and notice we've once again reached this breakpoint, we're in the max function call, right? But this time around, notice that our args are, uh, 10 and zero. So this is the second time we called max. Uh, we just said, hey, program, continue on until you reach this breakpoint again. And now we're paused here. And now let's look at our locals. So info locals. Now that's a surprising result. <laughs> no pun intended uh, that our variable name was actually result, but that is a surprising result. Uh, result is 100. We had just on the previous line declared a variable we, when, we, when we ran the same code above, uh, let's see if I can scroll up to it. Uh, oh, right here. Uh, when, we, when we ran info locals the first time this function call occurred, result was zero. But the second time this function call occurred, result is 100. That makes no sense. We've just declared this variable. We haven't assigned anything to it yet in this function call. Why is its value 100? Well, the spoiler here is if you don't initialize a variable in C, you can't depend at all on what its value is. And the fact that we tried to read its value before it had been initialized in this function call uh, is just giving us a garbage value. And we'll see it's a coincidental, uh, a very happy coincidence and intentional on this example that this value would be 100, which was the last value it was before. But before we get into the details of worrying about why that is, uh, we're just gonna let this be, right? And, 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 uh, reflect for a moment that this is a surprising uh, uh, outcome here. And this seems to be the heart of our problem as we're trying to debug. So the other thing I mentioned was uh, the, the, the stack. And so if we give the where command, what this is telling us is um, we are in currently the, the, the highest, the, this is a little bit strange because uh, it's saying stack frame zero is our current frame on the stack, which we know when we draw stack and environment diagrams uh, in, in memory, our stack actually uh, starts at a high value and then works its way down. So our frames actually build downward in memory. We'll spend a lot of time looking at that in more depth in the coming weeks. Um, and then where that max function is coming from is main. So it's printing these in reverse order because it's trying to give you the most helpful information closest to where you ran that command. We're currently in the where uh, function call. Uh, but notice that it is also telling us above us on the stack, we're coming from uh, line 17, which is in the main um, in, the, in the main function. So if I were to actually uh, list, say lines 10 through 20, you would notice that it said we're in main on line 17 and we can see that, oh yeah, of course, uh, that this was the second time that we called max, this was the second function call and we can see where we're at, right? So the where command tells you the, the list of frames uh, that, that are on your call stack. And so does backtrace, right? So backtrace and where are synonymous with another. You'll also see if you look in guides on the internet for how to use uh, uh, how to use GDB, BT is short for backtrace, but where is the one that I like because it tells you where you are in your program on the call stack. And that, so we're currently on line 26, that's where we're paused. If we were to continue from here, we would see that uh, what we expected to be printed out based on what we saw before, what even is life is printed, and then our process exits as our program quits and we're done with this session, all right? So that's how we break. 
The next thing we can do, uh, which I think is important to discuss, is we can set a conditional breakpoint. And this is going to cause some expression to be evaluated at a given line of code in our program. So if we wanted to break only at that specific line if result was equal to 100, so we know that result is equal to 100 for some reason, the second time it's called, well, we could set a conditional breakpoint so that it doesn't even get, we don't stop there at the very first uh, time through, right? So let's try demonstrating this really quickly, right? So we, we call, uh, we call the max function the first time around and result was zero, we saw. The second time around, for some reason, it was still 100. Right? So let's see if we can um, skip that first call to max and just have our program jump directly to the weird invocation that we're trying to fix as part of our, our debugging process. Right? So gdb a.out, we start our program up fresh. And I'm gonna say break, actually I've forgotten, I think it was line 26, but let's confirm list. Um, 24 through 28. Uh, yep, so line 26 is the line we're trying to break on. So break uh, line 26 if result uh, is equal to 100, right? So that's pretty cool. We can actually conditionally break if this is true, right? So if result is equal to 100 for some reason, and notice we've initialized it, we've, we've, there's no reason it should be 100. We still need to resolve why it is. Um, but let's just go ahead and try this. So we, we run this program and uh, notice that this time around, this is the, the second call to max. So uh, the first call to max had zero and 100 as the arguments. The second call to max had 10 and zero. And so we've successfully only broken right now because if we were to print result, result is currently a value of 100, right? So if you're writing a program where you've got a loop that for some reason on like, you know, the 30th iteration where I is 30, you've got this bug uh, and you want to pause inside your loop when I is 30, you can set a breakpoint at whatever line that you want the program to pause at. If I is equal to whatever loop iteration you wanted and have your, your program bring you up to that point, right? So we can have much more precise control over when we um, break using some of these conditional breaks like we're seeing here, All right? So that's what I wanted to show you with respect to a conditional break. I'm gonna uh, back out of this. Another thing that we can do, um, which we don't have a good example for in this particular file, is but, but it's called a watch and, and we can, um, I can give you one example here really quickly. This is much more useful in a loop or in a program where you've got lots of variables and you wanna know when is some specific variable actually changing. All right, so I'm gonna start up GDB one more time. And this time around, uh, I'm gonna list where we're at. And let's say we wanted to watch this H variable, all right? Uh, so I'm gonna start my program. And remember, start is saying, hey, put a breakpoint at the first line of code that's gonna be evaluated. So we haven't yet run, I is assigned zero, that's yet to happen. And what I wanna do is watch H, right? Um, this notion of a hardware watch point is a little bit beyond our concern, but there are some cool things that are happening deep down in the machinery that are saying, hey, when this particular variable changes in memory, uh, it's gonna very efficiently trigger um, the notification that tells us something changed, all right? So we step. And uh, notice we're about to hit this line where H is, is 100. We step again and notice that it tells us we've hit this watch point. The old value of H was zero and the new value of H is 100. And if this were inside of a loop, you could even have that loop run and it would just be watching for changes to some specific variable and give you some output on that, All right? So watching variables to see when something actually changes uh, can give you a sense of, of when things are happening. You can also watch expressions as the slide shows. Um, so you could watch uh, for when a particular uh, value exceeds some threshold and when that gets triggered, uh, it will uh, pause that the execution at that point. So this is a way of also pausing at, at some point and seeing what was the old value and what is the new value. Right, so these are sort of your bread and butter ways of saying, hey, I wanna pause at some specific either line, no matter what, or line if some condition is true or false, 
or there's like some actual expression that I want to watch and know what was the old value versus the new value. And as soon as this particular value or expression changes, uh, I want to, to pause at that example at that point. When you're debugging and you're trying to fix an issue in your code, you typically want to stop right before some bug occurs in your code, right? So you want to set the breakpoint before it happens, and that gives you a chance to pause and slow down and inspe inspect what is going on, what are my variable values, what happens when I step forward once, things like this. All right. When debugging, one of the things that feels a little bit tedious is, okay, you made a change and now you wanna go back and see if that change had some impact and fix the problem that you thought it would fix, right? Like we just, we set up a really nice breakpoint that said if um, this certain condition existed, we're gonna pause right there and that's how we would know we still have this bug in our program, right? Well, one of the things that will help you become a better programmer by debugging more quickly is trying to reflect on what is the best way for me to find a bug in my program. And if you really have no good sense of where something might be going wrong, I would encourage you to take a binary search approach, which is pause your program right in the middle somewhere, like if you can imagine the lifetime of its evaluation, like where is about the halfway point that you would think something might have gone wrong by, and then use a binary search. Well, if it wasn't there yet, then maybe look uh, uh, in the back half of your program and see, okay, well, let's set a breakpoint at the 75% mark. Um, but if it was visible in the first half, maybe you set a breakpoint at the 25% mark. Uh, and you're, having, you're gonna have to think about where that might logically be. Most of the time you have some sense or some intuition about where it's gonna be and you should follow that intuition. Uh, and one of the quickest ways of following that intuition is using GDB's execute flag, right? So one of the really great things about a textual tool like GDB is we can actually have some of those commands that we would normally type after we start up GDB run automatically as soon as GDB begins. And that way we can reuse those commands over and over until we fix our problem. Right, so we're gonna do an example of this where um, in this first example, I'm gonna show you uh, what the slide has and we can talk through this example where we're saying GDB and then dash X and then we use a string for what is the first command we want to execute. And then another X argument followed by the next command we wanna execute and then another X command followed by the next command we wanna execute. So notice we're executing break on line 26 we're setting up that breakpoint, then we're running our program, and then we're printing out our locals. And when we do this, if we try reproducing this, right? So I'm gonna start this on a new uh, screen here. GDB and execute break line 26, execute run the program, execute info locals, and the program we're gonna do this on is dot slash a dot out. Right, I'm gonna pause here for just a moment. Uh, and give you all a chance to run this to convince yourselves that these things are being evaluated. But to try and break this down before I run this, I just wanna try and uh, demystify some of what we're seeing here. This X flag is telling you, hey, we're about to execute some command as if you typed it once you started GDB. So we're setting that breakpoint. This one is saying, hey, go run the program. And this one is saying, once you hit a breakpoint, next I want you to print the locals at that point. All right, so I'm gonna try running this real quick. And uh, I think because I had run out of space in my terminal, it was saying, hey, let me give you a chance to read all of this, either that or it was paused at the start. Uh, but because my text is so big, no way for me to know. But if you had to press enter, then uh, it was just trying to confirm that we're running the program. And notice that we're in the max function already, our program is paused at line 26 and result is currently zero, right? Well, we just saw we really wanted to pause if result was 100. So why don't we actually quit out of this? And oops, you don't have to use parentheses after quit. So I'm gonna use just the quit command and yes. And now I'm going to try, um, I'm just gonna go back and edit this command break 26 if result is equal to 100, right? And I might just, so that this all fits on one line, uh, I just remove that, those spaces, it shouldn't matter, right? 
So I'm changing this and notice that these three things are gonna happen as soon as GDB starts up, all right? So I just changed the break 26 if result is equal to 100. Uh, it's asking me to press enter. I press enter and boom, now we're paused right at the point in our program where the second call to max had occurred, result is 100, and it seems like we need to go figure out what the problem is here, all right? So that's pretty interesting. Uh, we've got the ability to uh, now go work on our program, and so I'm gonna quit again, we can now go update our program, recompile it, and then cause that exact same debugging workflow to be uh, executed just by looking back in our history and rerunning this, this command. So this allows you to very quickly reproduce some debugging steps to get back into some part of the program that you want to investigate as you're working on it, right? And that will help you speed up your work tremendously. There's one more thing I want to show you before we actually go and fix our bug. Right, which is a very perplexing thing, but will um, ultimately give us some insight into what is going on behind the scenes. All right, so um, let's try running uh, Vim and opening up our debug.c file. And on the first line of Vim, I'm gonna uh, go to line seven, so seven capital G, and then I'm gonna press O to begin writing a new line below the line that I'm currently on. And let's try printing F here. Um, and we'll print f of uh, what is happening. Right? It doesn't actually matter what this uh, printf statement is printing. Uh, any message is fine here. Right? So I'm going to save with colon w to write my work to disk. It tells us that this file has been saved, or I could have just done capital ZZ. The point is I've added a line just below main to print some string. Right? So shift ZZ to save and quit. And now we do need to recompile, right? So uh, GCC, we want our um, debug flags. We want our standard to be C11 and I want debug.c, all right? When we run this program with these same debugging steps, if I just um, go back up in my history and try running the exact same steps that we did before, let's see what happens. So. What happens is we never hit a break point. Well, that's interesting. We never hit a point where result was equal to 100. But we did print all three of those lines. Notice we, we, we reached what is happening only in 2020. What even is life, right? So this is some indication that result the second time around wasn't 100 for some reason. And something else must have happened after that print statement. So what's going on? So let's see how we can actually uh, change our debug statement to see something a little bit different. Right. So what if we stopped when result was not equal to zero? Right. So previously, the first time we called max, result was initialized to zero, seemingly by luck. And the short story of how we're gonna fix this is we actually need to initialize it to zero for this to work, um, but we haven't initialized it anything. So if it's not zero, maybe that's the condition we should pause on at that point to get some insight about what's going on. Right, so I've run this command, we're, we're gonna pause as soon as that result at that variable at that line is not equal to zero. I press enter and that is totally mind blowing. Result is 22,074. Total garbage, right? This is a meaningless value. We have no way of explaining based on the code that we've written, right? And the short story is this is just whatever was in this variables location and memory that was reserved for it or allocate for it um, before we initialized it and we didn't initialize it correctly uh, and so for some reason when we called printf this location and memory in our stack frames was 22074. Uh, i'm going to come back to this but for now let's actually just go see if we can fix our program all right so we quit anyway and let's see if we can uh, actually produce a fix inside of our program uh, to get rid of this issue. So I'm opening up, I quit out of GDB, the quit command, enter yes to stop the program. Um, and now I'm gonna go, we know that this is happening on line 25, that's where uh, the result was, variable was being declared. So I'm gonna say 25 as the line number and G to go directly to it. Oh, and we had added that print statement, so we're actually um, moved this down one line to line 26. 
That is, I should note, one thing you should be careful with uh, is if you are changing lines, those break points, you need to be careful about the line numbers potentially shifting. So um, it's not a magic bullet. You just have to keep track of, of, generally, as long as you're in the vicinity and you're changing small values, it's not a concern. But if you're changing significant chunks of code, be sure your line numbers still make sense. So the problem here, which many of you picked up on, and some of you may have already fixed, is we didn't initialize our variable. And I'm gonna get to the bottom of why this is so important and what's actually happening to cause these phenomenon in just a moment. Um, but now that we've fixed our problem by saying, okay, let's actually initialize result to zero, uh, we're gonna save this program, so shift Z, and I'm gonna go recompile it. And I'm gonna try debugging it one more time. Uh, and I'm gonna change this line to line 26. So break on line 26, sorry, sorry. I'm gonna change line 26 to 27. So break on line 27 if result is not equal to zero. That would be totally surprising, right? We don't expect this program to break because we just said we're gonna initialize result to zero each time that max function is evaluated. So we run and notice what is happening is printed and then nothing is nothing completes. We see that this process, the program that we were running exited normally. There's no frame that we're in because our process completed and life is good. Things are happy. Things make sense now, right? Uh, so I'm gonna quit out of GDB. And if I wanted to just run that program directly, we, we see what is happening printed and we're in a good place, all right? So I'm gonna open up um, questions, but before I take questions, I'm gonna come back to questions in just a moment, um, but I wanna give you all a chance to ask questions. Uh, I wanna talk through what's actually happening at a very high level and then, oops, I don't think I meant to open that on Polar Doer, one sec. Uh, I wanna talk through what is happening in the stack that's leading to this phenomenon. Uh, great, okay. Uh, so I'm gonna open this, um, I'm gonna go back to the slide that we started on, all right. And I'm actually going to move this. Okay, so what's happening and what caused this particular um, phenomenon to occur? I'm gonna do this in a very hand-waving fashion uh, to just give you a sense of what's going on under the hood. And in the next few weeks, we're gonna be looking at memory with much more detail. But we know from earlier programming experiences, we have a function call stack, right? And we know that our program begins in the main function and there's a frame for main. And somehow there's some space allocated for like say I and H, right? Those are local variables that exist in main. And I'm just gonna do this in a very hand-waving fashion, right? Um, but notice we've got some space for these variables. We initialize, you know, I to zero, H to 100, and all is good. When we reach this call to max, we know that we are adding a new frame to our stack. Right, so we're adding max here. And the place where we're gonna go back with an answer or with our return value is line 11. And we've got two arguments that we need to set up, so A and B. Uh, and so A is given a value of I and main, so zero, and B is given a value of 100, all right? And okay, we set up result, but we don't initialize it. All right, and this will, this will come back to bite us. This is why we always, always, always initialize our variables. All right, so we set up the space for result, okay. And we check, and um, when our program gets started up, um, something that's happening behind the scenes is like all of the, like remember, we're, we're thinking about this all as like lots of binary. Uh, the space on the stack gets zeroed out. So we see all zero bits behind the scenes where these things are happening. I should also mention that, again, the, the variable names are something that we're doing to keep track of this for us, that the debugging symbols would know where these variables are located relative to frames on the stack, but the computer actually has no notion of. The only thing the computer has a notion of in our actual frames on the stack are um, objects in memory, so chunks of binary uh, that are allocated and treated in, in, in certain ways. Uh, and so all of this is zeroed out. So result is initially zero because of this, because its bits are all zeros, okay? So we test is A greater than result. Well, A is zero, result is zero, that's false. We test is B greater than result. That's true because B is 100 and result is zero. So result gets a value of 100, right? 
And so now its location in memory reads whatever the binary bit pattern is for 100. Let me see. This is just a little bit too fine for me to, there we go. All right, so we've got 100 for our result. And then we ultimately return result, right? So the return value here is 100. And that causes 100 to uh, be sent back to this point. And 100 not equal to 100, that's false. So we don't print only in 2020. So now things are about to get interesting. We have to figure out, well, what is happening in this chunk? This is where we initially saw our problems and our concerns. Well, i is being assigned 10 in main, so i's bits are updated to have a value of 10 in them. Of course, this would be in binary uh, patterns, but we're thinking about this in terms of decimal for our own explanation. H is going to be zero. And then we reach this next call to max. Well, one of the things we didn't really talk about in 110 is what happens to a function call frame after it's completed. And it turns out not much. Uh, when we returned, the computer keeps track of where is the bottom of the lowest stack. But when it jumps into a new function call, it says, okay, well, let's, let's make some space for a new function call and let's set up our parameter values. So, okay, we set up our parameter values. Uh, well, 10 is being assigned to A, right? So uh, 10 was I's value and B is being initialized to zero. That's H's value that was being sent to the parameter B, right? And that's all that happens as part of the frame setup process. Our parameters get evaluated. So we jump in and notice that result still has whatever value was in memory at that point in the stack from some previous call. And that previous call had a value of 100 at that point on the stack, which is should be totally horrifying that somehow some leftover remaining value from some other function is what's being evaluated here. But nevertheless, that is the case for why result is initialized to 100 the second time this max function is called. I'm not gonna dig into exactly why um, this was different the first time, the fun like when we added this print statement, right? When we added printf, uh, the short story on why we saw a very random 22,000 something result was, well, the next frame was printf, right? Uh, in a, in, so the first time when our main function began, we had this printf call and printf had its own contents in memory that initialized, you know, for some reason, 22,000 something was where result would be the next time the max function was called. Uh, and so we're just seeing a garbage value that was whatever was previously on the call stack at that point in memory by chance, randomness, and, 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 and otherwise misfortune. So the key thing to take away from this little debugging exercise is it's always, always, always important in C and generally in every programming language, even though most programming languages uh, that are higher level programming languages will automatically initialize your variables to zero like Java will, uh, it's always a good habit to, to explicitly in your code and especially in C, um, initialize your variables. The last thing I want to show you before I uh, move to these questions really quick, we've got five minutes left, is um, if I go back to debug.c, I'm going to reintroduce this error. You don't need to do this, but I'm going to remove this initialization, right? So the first thing I want to point out is we notice this chevron that says, hey, there, it looks like there's a warning here. And if you notice, it says at the bottom of our screen, when I bring our, my cursor in Vim to this point, this variable is uninitialized. If you're seeing any warnings about an uninitialized variable, you should fix those. You should treat those as catastrophic, crazy things not to fix, right? So this is a problem. The other thing that you know that we do is we tend to use W extra and W all for extra warnings uh, and G and then standard equals C11 when we compile. And if I were to have compiled in this way with these warnings enabled, you'll notice that it would have told me that result was uninitialized and it gives me the exact point that I tried to read from that variable without having initialized it beforehand. So one of the reasons why we use these warnings is because they will tell us when we run into situations like this. All right. So the readings, oh, uh, where are the readings posted? They should be on Gradescope, but I may have set the due date to be in the wrong time. Let me fix that. Oh, I set them to 11 p.m. instead of a.m. 
Classic PM AM problem. Thank you for pointing that out. I am changing them to AM right now. Great question. Sorry about that. All right, next question. Um, in so the question was pulling from. Actually, I think we addressed that earlier on. Uh, let me see. There's some new questions in here. Ah, so someone asked about garbage collection and whether this is the garbage that we're talking about. <laughs> There's a lot of garbage in memory you'll come to find. This is a great question. I love this question. Um, this is not the garbage that we're talking about uh, in garbage collection in Java and other managed memory languages, but we will learn exactly what that is soon. Garbage collection actually is a heap concern. So when we start to allocate memory that's not in our call stack, so that's not local variables, but we actually have some objects living in the heap, which is a separate area of memory we'll come to learn, um, we have to be much more careful about how those objects are freed up or deleted once we're done with them. And, and we'll get it all into the details of that soon. But um, garbage collection in the Java sense or in the managed programming language sense, like Python, JavaScript, and all those languages, is about um, when can I delete my objects? And when can I delete my arrays that live on the heap? And the short answer is, as long as there's some point in your program that still has a reference to your object, so you could still access it, you don't want to delete it. But garbage collection is able to determine when there's no more references to some object in the heap, that's when it's okay to delete it and it takes care of that. We'll see in C and in C++ we have to keep track of those concerns on our own. When I say garbage values here and specifically um, with uninitialized variables, it has to do with we're talking about on the call stack, um, when a function returns that, that stack actually, we, we treat it as deleted, but, but nothing is done to clear it out. And so there's still whatever values it needed in its local variables are just left over. And when we go back to set up a new function call just below the current function we're in, like for a new function call, whatever garbage values were left over for, from some previous function are just what's gonna be used until we initialize our variables. All right. So why is a new stack not created? Um, this is the last question I'll take, and then I'm gonna show one more slide and, and then we'll wrap up. Um, the key idea, so w w there's, there's a lie that we told you in 1.10, uh, which was when we um, said main, and then we had some function call for max, and then we had another function call for max, even though this one had returned, um, in 1.10 we kept a proof of work, uh, and this is pretty common and we said that, hey, even though this function calls returned, it's still taking up some space on our paper. We don't want you to erase it all. Well, in, in computers, we would run out of memory um, if we had thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions of, of function calls, um, like inside of a loop, if, if we kept the same strategy. So the lie in 110 is that these things stick around um, after they return. In reality, uh, any time a function returns, we, we the computer thinks that it can use that space for another frame right away. And it conceptually, we like to think of it as getting deleted immediately as soon as it returns. So we return a value and then that, that, that memory is reclaimed. Um, but the, the idea of deleting something, that takes extra work to re-zero out some segment of memory. So we actually just leave whatever was there and just say, well, we, we're gonna assume that that's not useful anymore. Um, so these are great questions, and if you have more, I would encourage stopping by office hours and talking to us. I just want to point out that the last slide has uh, some fundamental GDB commands. This is You can think of this as a cheat sheet. Uh, as you're working with your uh, programs, having these handy should help you get more comfortable with GDB. Um, but with GDB in your tool set, you should be able to work through uh, debugging the problems that you're seeing as you're working on the current problem set and those to come. Uh, great work today. Sorry for going a couple minutes over, uh, but uh, good to be back with you. My AC is working, so we're, we're in business, uh, and uh, good luck finishing out this, this problem set. That's all for today. Uh, we'll see you all on Friday.